Okay, so you're very welcome along this afternoon to this workshop and um, this Teens Online workshop as part of Douglas Week. And Wednesday, is, a lot of today is about music. So be sure that you um, stick around with us. Um, later on, we'll have a musical evening and there's another workshop with the guys right after this. Um, we've also have, have an interactive singing workshop later. So there's plenty of music going on today. So um, do check that out on our website, www douglasincourt.com and we're just delighted to welcome you to this wide-ranging celebration of the great abolitionist Frederick Douglass and his visit to Ireland. So I'm just going to hand over now to my colleague Tim for a little bit of housekeeping before we begin the event but we hope you enjoy yourselves and um, have a great time. Thank you very much. Thanks Sarah and uh, welcome again to everybody. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Um, just a couple of housekeeping details. This uh, event will last approximately one hour. Um, for your information, it's going to be recorded as, as are all the events this week um, and made available later. So please be aware of that. Um, if you want to ask questions, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and, and we'll be keeping an eye on those questions as they come in. We'll make sure the panelists have a chance to see them and answer them uh, at, at the appropriate time during the, uh, during the event. I think that's everything, right? I think we can hand over um, to Stevie and Fiona and uh, and um, enjoy. Hi, um, I'll get going then. Um, you're all very welcome um, to our special online Teams music workshop as part of Douglas Week. Um, my name is Fiona and I work in a place called Barrettstown. It's an amazing Irish children's charity that was founded in Kildare in 1994 by American actor Paul Newman. And it offers um, free, specially designed, life-changing camps and programs for children and families who are living with serious illness. Um, we're very proud to be partnered with um, the Douglas Week commemorations this year. Um, a wonderful parallel, obviously, between uh, the two transatlantic humanitarians. Um, our friend, uh, Cork DJ and musical historian CVG here is going to lead the workshop today and he will introduce our amazing guests. Um, but we just wanted to say on behalf of Barrettstown, a huge thank you to these amazing artists for sharing their time and their talent today and also to Douglas Week um, for connecting us all so that we could put this workshop together for you. Um, so without further ado, and me waffling on, I will hand over to Stevie. Um, and again, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function or raise your hand rather than interrupting. Thanks, guys. Thanks a million, Fiona. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Sarah. I want to congratulate all the gang, including Caroline as well and Kristen, uh, everyone who's been putting together Douglas Week for months and months. I think I started talking to the guys in September, but I know it's been going on uh, way before that. We've got amazing guests here today. Um, and I think they're the stars of the show, really. So I'm going to put it to them very shortly. Uh, it's the first time I've ever been des uh, described as a music historian. So I was like, that actually sounds official. Uh, I learned about music myself through DJing for many years, through album covers, through learning about producers, writers, and it's mainly black music, hip hop, and, and hip hop got me into all sorts of music from across the world. Um, in a way, which I'll talk about in a moment, uh, hip hop is almost like um, a bastardized music. In some in some ways, it's it's almost uh, like a new form of other forms, and it's got interesting parallels with uh, what Frederick Douglass has done with his journey and his impact. Even now, I'm aware that it's mostly teenagers today. That's the the, the group I specialize in um, in working with normally and uh, you're all very welcome so I'm going to try to keep things as simple as possible I'm only going to chat for about 10 minutes but I really would encourage you to ask questions because it's hard all I'm seeing is screens with loads of Frederick Douglass's beautiful screens of color um, but uh, it would be cool to kind of to, to see what we've got and any questions are more than welcome so please uh, use the Q&A and raise your hand I'm going to introduce Paul and Nikhil properly in a moment but I'm going to just quickly give you a little bit of a background Not not through, not through my own um, 
a basic background, like I'm a radio DJ club, DJ play all the festivals, done some amazing gigs with amazing people, been really lucky to DJ uh, before Beyonce and Destiny's Child, Kanye West, uh, Snoop, Jay-Z, all of these people. But to be honest, the stuff I've, I've really enjoyed over the years is learning about music and passing on that little bit of knowledge uh, through the teenagers we work with in the Cork Migrant Centre in Nanonagel Place. Uh, we have another uh, workshop with them later, and Paul and Nikhil are, are, are uh, kindly joining us again, and we're really excited to have them in Cork. I haven't met them physically yet, but that's the way it's been uh, lately for us all. And it is challenging times, um, but uh, like I just mentioned before we got on air here, uh, there were challenging times back in the day, uh, much much more challenging when Frederick Douglass actually did visit Cork in Ireland, and um, it was a um, it was there's some there's some parallels there. Let's put it that way. I want to talk to Paul and Nikhil about their journey here because in a way it mirrors that in some degrees. But I'm just going to quickly talk about something that I feel very strongly about, and it's about migration and the musical melting pot and what it's given us. I'll just give you a little quick background of a couple of notes. Um, imagine if we only had one form of music, uh, one type of clothes, food. We saw actually what happened in Ireland uh, back in the days when Frederick Douglass visited first, um, when we became overly dependent on one type of food in the Great Famine. Uh, I grew up in Ireland where there was less colour, uh, there was less variety, less diversity. It wasn't as exciting when I was a youngster, uh, I can tell you that much. And now we have new voices, new faces, new music, new art, new culture. This melting pot of styles and cultures is what created hip hop, which a lot of you will know of um, being youngsters. I hope you do anyway. The most commercially powerful and influential music in the world, in some respects, you could say these days, once seen as a novelty, once dismissed by those who didn't understand it. And being teenagers, you probably know what it's like to be kind of misunderstood and to be told like that your clothes or your hair or your, your musical taste or your attitudes are, are, are kind of like out of line or whatever. But like, I feel strongly that uh, the, the young people should always be listened to true music and fashion and everything else. Hip hop was dismissed as a novelty, as I say, a constant recurring theme actually in black music, which hip hop is a subject set off. Uh, it is black music and um, there's a lot of racial, we'll say, um, degrees throughout history. Like it's, it is kind of interesting the way it took Elvis to basically be the marketable version of what rock and roll and R&B artists from a black persuasion were doing for many years. Same happened with Eminem in many ways and some people would even kind of were even suggesting at the time that this was like revolutionary. He's a great MC, don't get me wrong, but Eminem, like myself and like Elvis, we were all just white students of black music, and that's what we passed on. You know, um, they were quite um, probably a little bit better known though. A constant recurring team in black music, as I say, and this is black music. It came from everywhere, but it's black music. Music is a welcoming place, and it's a great way of communicating and breaking down boundaries. Uh, and I should say that I keep talking about terms and that's what journalists and people like us use. And but music is music. There's only two types, good and bad. But just for simplicity's sake, I am going to just mention terms like hip hop and reggae and black music. It's a great way of communicating and breaking down boundaries, as I said, but it's important to recognize what we are consuming to pay homage as well. Uh, back in the day when I started on while well, I was doing pirate radio in the 90s, but I called my radio show on Corks Red FM, Black on Red. Uh, back in 2002 to acknowledge the roots of this music that I try to celebrate. Uh, one or two people had a problem with it at the time and they were saying it was racist and all that. But I'm like, this is black music. you got to pay homage. You know what I mean? Uh, Hip hop is built on the blues, soul, reggae, jazz, rock, Latin and many other formats. In a way, uh, it was the unwanted leftovers that many purists didn't like. Uh, I touched on that earlier. It helped reestablish the soul and funk and jazz that had actually become whitewashed by the mainstream um, in the 80s and 90s. Um, particularly in the 80s, I think, where a lot of uh, black music pioneers were, were sort of pushed out. It's very interesting if you look at disco, which is another ultimate black music, uh, very black, very Hispanic, very gay. Uh, there was a massive racial back, backlash against disco um, in the, at the end of the 70s and in the early 80s. And lots of these amazing artists were, were pushed to the side. No, it got repackaged. It went up more underground and came back as house music. And lots of the pop artists of the day actually developed as artists in their own rights, uh, whether it was Madonna and all that. But like disco was very important music. And it shows that the, the racial element has been at play for many years in the music industry. Um, 
artists such as James Brown and Roy Ayers and even Ray Charles were becoming forgotten about in this era, but hip, the hip hop generation brought them back in some ways. I've met many of these uh, great art, um, jazz and soul artists myself uh, through bringing them here for gigs and through, through, through interviews or whatever. Uh, I've chatted to them, Roy Ayers, Lonnie Liston-Smith, Herbie Hancock, Candy State and Marlena Shaw. And many of them admit that sampling and this reverence from youngsters, uh, at the time I was a teenager, but it was us youngsters, we get, helped give them a new lease of life. Hip hop's uh, ethos about respect and history um, were important. It wasn't just thieving other people's music as, as some of the media were, were talking about at the time. Hip hop is now everywhere, everywhere you look. Uh, the melting pot all around the world, it gives us what teenagers are listening to. Cardi B from a racially diverse background in New York City. Drake uh, from Canada. Kendrick Lamar, Tupac, uh, RIP, obviously. Over in the UK, we got Skepta, Stormzy. We got Kanye back in the US. Megan, Travis Scott, the baby. In Ireland, we have Denise Chyla. Uh, friends of mine like JLOL, Denise, uh, Reggie Snow, and many more. People from everywhere who are now here and they're now ours. They're Irish. Uh, hip-hop takes them everywhere. Hip-hop also gives back. Hip-hop is globally huge right now. Hip-hop is in Hamlet. Hamilton. The guys are going to talk about Hamilton. I'm going to ask them about Hamilton in a moment. But like, this is a cool way of bringing historic stuff back into. Um, and hip hop is unfiltered as well. It's direct. It's right into you. Uh, Chuck D of Public Enemy once said it was a black people's CNN. And in a way, uh, we all know these days that the news media isn't always um let's just say, uh, legitimate. Uh, you can see that in, in, in the way Trump got the power. You can see that all around the world. Um, but hip-hop is unfiltered. It's direct. Hip-hop is is everything. It's all over TikTok, Instagram. It's mainstream pop. You listen to the pop music now, Dua Lipa, Ed Sheeran, there's rappers everywhere. Hip-hop generation brought us Pharrell, Beyonce, Nas, Biggie, Missy, Rihanna, Snoop, and many more. It's fashion. Uh, hip-hop is street art, as we know. Uh, the original elements are still flourishing, and we still have graph breakdancing, emceeing, and DJing. Uh, you can see a lot of that in Hamilton as well. Hip-hop is the shining example that the melting pot is good. Music uh, is exciting, as is variety. Differences can be celebrated, uh, and we can help create new music and fashion and cultures and friendships, which we're all about. Borders, whether they're physical or mental, limit us. The world is ours. And um, as many rappers have said to the new generation, and I've always used this as a team in my workshops, the world is yours, especially to the young people. You see what people like Greta are doing. Down here, we've got the climate change youth activists. Uh, we've got our CMC group. These people are making changes. They're the generation. Uh, my generation felt that we couldn't make the changes in some degrees, but at the moment, I really see the progress and I really see that the youngsters can create a new world where we are um, more racially aware, where we know about climate a lot more than we did when I was a kid, let's put it that way. Frederick Douglass, I'm sure, would concur on all of these things. Um, and uh, I'm sure he would, um, I'm sure he'd actually listen to hip hop, you know, I can, I can, I can see him or I can feel him and when I hear Kendrick Lamar or whatever. I want to quickly talk about migration and slavery as well in another way. Uh, just a little, quick little bit I did about um, the African drum. It's believed by many African communities that the voices of great ancestors are hidden inside the wood of trees so that be, they could be accessed wherever men and women needed them. African history has been maintained through an oral tradition, which is very important. Uh, we've got a big folk tradition in Ireland, um, but I think this is very important, especially when it comes to migration and slavery. During their journey from Africa to the United States, uh, slaves were encouraged to beat the drum. They were actually encouraged uh, to beat the drum. The hope was that beating the drum would keep their morale as high as possible. Uh, but interestingly, upon arrival in the Americas, beating the drum was forbidden for most slaves, which I think is very important. There's interesting parallels with how slaves were not allowed to learn to read and write, which Frederick Douglass rebelled against, and even in how later black music formats such as jazz, blues, and even hip hop were targeted and suppressed through censorship and other moral dubious uh, means. The music that enslaved Africans brought with them a voice for the condition, a new language that offered solidarity and solace. Uh, an interesting quote from Bonnie Greer, the drum itself represents to me the idea of voyage and crossing. I crossed the Atlantic to be here and the drum did too. It represents for me that passage of my ancestors and the ancestors of a good number of black British citizens as well. And the slave owners, interestingly as well, feared the drum, the call and response, which you can later hear in soul, jazz, blues, and even rap, it made them uncomfortable. In, in my view, such, uh, in my view, sorry, uh, racism, hom 
homophobia, sexism, etc., is based on fear and ignorance. I'm sure a lot of us know that. And again, there's a clear line from such fears uh, which are around the world in, in Ireland and elsewhere in 2021. The drums were a symbol of revolution for some, and many feared the slaves were using them to communicate and rise up. Uh, there are parallels, actually, with how the Irish language was treated here under imperial rule. And it's one of the reasons why I'm speaking English today, um, which is a bit sad when you think about it. In America, out of um, the 250 revolts, only two were aided by drums. So it shows that uh, this was all uh, wrong. Resistance and celebration was, that's what drums were used uh, instead for. Uh, also escape. After the abolition of slavery, marching bands were popular. The instruments were portable. The drums were actually made from wood and skins, as we know. Uh, but if you laid them out on the floor, they were treated individually, played by one player. And it was only then... Uh, someone revolutionized it and put them all together and made a drum kit, which, which became the catalyst for the music in the 20th century. They tried to ban the innovation and communication. And again, the parallels are here today in so many things that we are in the way we communicate. Uh, they tried to ban the innovation and communication, but it had the opposite effect. Although African-American music is widely known and loved and much popular North American music emerged from it, white American music also has strong African roots, which a lot of people don't, don't realize. The musical traditions, even of the Irish and Scottish settlers, merged with African-American musical elements to become old time and bluegrass, amongst other genre, genres. Uh, white slave owners sought to completely subjugate their slaves physically, mentally and spiritually through brutality and demeaning acts. African-Americans use music to counter this dehumanization. Slave feels, scatting, call and response, spoken, rapping, chanting. You can, you can see the, the line. I can see it clearly anyway. Um, it actually led to barbershops. It led to jazz and blues. It led to R&B and rock and roll. It led to soul and funk and reggae. And it led to hip hop, which we were talking about, and uh, which is one of the reoccurring themes uh, of what I want to talk about. Um, I would love to get some questions. I had planned to talk a little bit about reggae. How am I for time? Yeah, I'm just going to actually talk a little bit about reggae before I go over to the guys because I don't want to be chatting up. Normally, I would have all music and stuff set up as well, but I'm, I'm conscious of time today. But um, reggae is quite interesting to me because a lot of people wouldn't see the direct line. Uh, most people just think of reggae and they just think of some guy with dreads. They think about Marley. They might even think of Sean Paul these days. The, the younger generation might think of someone else. Um, but it's very interesting because, again, it shows the importance and power of the melting pot of migration, of of travel and of different kinds of communication. Jamaica is quite interesting, right? I've got it here, I think, in my little globe. I don't know if you can see my globe, but Jamaica is actually tiny, right? It's about the seventh, uh, is that Jamaica? Yeah, it's in the Caribbean. It's about a seventh of the size of Ireland, uh, maybe not much bigger than Cork County, which is, which is mind blowing, really. Uh, there's other similarities between uh, Cork and Jamaica too. We tend to use the word boy a lot and our, our accents are quite similar. And we have this kind of laid back uh, attitude, which means we sometimes don't get that much work done. But they certainly do that in Jamaica, I got to say, um, because they was so influential down there in the islands um, in creating so much music that has bounced all around the world through migration. Back in 1962, Jamaica got in the independence, uh, a similar story to Ireland in some degrees, but there was a lot of pride um, they still had their own music identity, but in the, in the early 50s, sound systems uh, had started in Jamaica. And like, like Ireland, which is between America and England, we're obviously much closer to England, but our, our musical references are often between the two powerhouses of the music industry, uh, England and America. Uh, Jamaica was very influenced um, by American music. Now you could hear radio, depending which way the wind blow, but you can hear the radio from, from, um, from America down in Jamaica, right? Because they had powerful signals. And the Jamaican, the, the, the average Jamaican music fan was listening to American R&B. Like people were all around the world, but it was really influential down there. Fast Domino, Louis Jordan, Ray Charles is who I mentioned earlier. The radio was very influential. And um, there was loads of sound systems, which is basically a guy rolling up and just having massive speakers and just uh, playing it really loud outdoors because they've the, they had the, the better weather than we have. We don't we don't do too many outdoor parties here, unfortunately. Record production, the industry started. Jazz musicians and musicians were doing Jamaican versions of R and B. 
um, they eventually picked up the pace and uh, a, a faster kind of music, which is almost Jamaican itself, ska developed. But the rhythms were all coming from um, from the jazz of New Orleans, which and a lot of that originated from different sets of migration. And lots of it does trace back to Africa, which a lot of things do, you know. Um, as prosperity came with independence, the record companies, uh, the whole music industry started. Um, there was an Alpha Boy School, a, a band who we had in Cork a couple of times, the Scatolites developed. There was absolutely interesting thing then, as well as that um, even though Jamaica got independence from England, lots of migration happened to England, in England or to England, because England was in a post-war period and they needed workers, they needed a workforce to get the booming economy going. And uh, it became economically viable for Irish people as well and Jamaicans to move to England. Now they moved in their masses. There was actually campaigns to get them over there. And this happened between Ireland and America too once, once upon a time. But the Jamaican music, uh, they kept to, their, to, to themselves, but the the music was very influential in the UK, helped to create this whole mod music, which is very, uh, a lot of crossover with soul music. Uh, Chris Blackwell, who ended up signing Bob Marley, ended up kind of been one of the major people in island music who later signed U2. Uh, he had the first massive uh, reggae hit with Millie Small. She died recently. It was my boy, Lollipop. Um, but things changed and the music slowed down and the, the initial um, buzz of freedom and independence actually changed. And the whole mood changed. Violence came, the, the music slowed down. And actually, all this time, the music was developing because they couldn't get the Americans over. It was too expensive. They were reinterpreting the, the music. And then the Jamaicans found that they wanted the music slower. And they ended up finding founding their own music, which out of ska became reggae. Um, music was always about escape. It was like escape from the ghetto, uh, all that kind of thing. It's, it's, it's a constant team in in reggae music there's a constant team in rap and lots of the best music worldwide has come from downtrodden communities uh who feel um they have been basically left for dead by the government or whatever you can see that in the music of bob marley or whatever actually i've got a lot of reggae here but i don't think people want to hear me blabbing on about reggae forever but i will just i do i do want to draw the line between reggae and hip-hop because people don't see the connection but in hip hop, in the in the in the ghettos, right, similar to to what was happening in Jamaica, they had the big sound systems, um, which were kind of competing against each other. The speakers became bigger and bigger. Uh, they had different different methods to make their sound system. So the interesting thing about this was in uh, like in the Bronx in the seventies, uh, again it was it was left left for dead and i find it interesting in ireland even that lots of the best hip-hop comes from places that that are economically kind of like ignored in ireland at the moment you can find the best hip-hop coming from waterford and limerick which wouldn't be the economically places that have always been backed we'll say by the government and you can find that that pattern all over the world particularly in la and new york and these sound systems uh, were competing and technology was becoming bigger and bigger and the sound systems were competing against each other in this in the same way it actually ended up solving a lot of the gang situation because people like africa mabada went to sound systems rather than than fighting in the streets or whatever but loads of the technological advances of reggae are mirrored in hip-hop you can find it in the version which is um the instrumental which they used to flip over the record and play the instrumental version and then the the local mc the mc in jamaica it's kind of complicated he's known as the dj he would do his own thing then they'd put effects on it then then they'd bring their own music and then they'd record that and it, it actually developed a lot of the the styles which came from jazz again scatting and rapping um which again uh, all all originated in jazz and lots of it originated uh, in the Jamaican migration um, to New York. New York is a, a city of people from all over the world, whether they're Irish, Jamaican, Hispanic, wherever, Italian. Uh, but the DJ, cool DJ Herc, was a Jamaican guy who was very influential in bringing this whole sound um, to New York. Uh, you can see it all through the, the years. It actually got a bit violent, some of the music. Uh, it got darker and it was mirrored in gangster rap. Um, one thing I always had a problem with, and I still do, is that it can be a bit degrading uh, to women the same way as gangster rap. And some people would look at it in Jamaica and they 
they, they try to defend it by saying it's empowering, but like I, I don't, it doesn't really play with me. And and certainly the gangster rap thing, lots of it, the the stuff is indefensible. Now I always will say that like rap music does reflect its society, um, but it's not a way of defending stuff. And I'm pretty thankful about the way in Ireland in 2021, at uh, the rappers. Um, lots of them, uh, and it, it's been really cool in the last few years that worldwide, um, the women have really like it's always been there in rap, and it's always been there from from the sixties and seventies, but the women have really taken over um, in a good way, and it's 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 kind of cool. And in Ireland, we've a lot of strong female voices. Sailor the Vida May, uh, we've got Denise, as I mentioned earlier, and we've really strong lyricists uh, bringing it, and. All of the kids we work with in Cork, uh, all the girls can can spit bars, and and it's brilliant because they were brought up on Nicki Minaj and Cardi and Megan, and and it's really cool to see um, that 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 women are are bringing this direct approach of music right into into the the eardrums of, of people. And as I say, music is always youth culture as well. And it's great to hear a young voice speaking. Listen, I've got other notes, but I don't want to talk too much. Uh, but I want to get the guys on. Uh, I would be interested if anyone's any questions on that um, before we get the guys in. Is there anyone asking any questions? Because I'm conscious of the fact that I've just been blabbing on and you're probably you're probably in school and stuff at the moment. So you do, you, you're just looking at guys like me every day, just blabbing on. No questions so far, Stevie. I think you're okay. Okay, that's fine. Uh, we can come back to them anyway. I want to talk to, I want to introduce uh, our wonderful guests, like Frederick Douglass, they're visiting Ireland. And like Frederick Douglass, they're not just here. Well, I suppose it's the, it's, it's, it is 2021, so you can't just come in and out anyway. But these guys are here properly. Like they're, they're traipsing through Ireland for a couple of months and learning and uh, getting inspired like Frederick Douglass as well. I've got Paul Oakley Staval and I've got Nikhil as well as Sa Sabu. I hope I, Sabu or Sabu? I should really know by now, uh, but I'd like to introduce them. First of all, I'd, I'd like them to just um, basically give a bit of background. I, I'm, I'm, I'll ask you some questions in a while, guys, but I would like to, like, where is the connection and where did it start for you guys with Frederick Douglass? Uh, before we talk about Hamilton and everything else, um, it's quite interesting that most people here whether they're youngsters or whether they're people of our generation, we didn't really learn about Frederick Douglass in the history books or whatever. We all know that uh, in America, the history books haven't always been accurate uh, about things either. So how did you guys discover Frederick Douglass? If you, if you could just start with that and, um, and, and we'll go from there. Yeah, shall I, shall I jump right in? Yeah. yeah, Paul, you go ahead. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, thank you so much for having us. Uh, it's been a thrilling adventure, traipsing around. It's a, it's a perfect way to put it, traipsing around um, the island. I learned about Frederick Douglass, Douglass in the American school system. Uh, unfortunately, as what happens with not just African-American heroes, but even some of our heroes, the women in, in, come to mind, you sort of get a, a page or a day on Frederick Douglass or in, in Black History Month, he gets his day along with uh, Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King. So I learned about him in that way in elementary school. And then in college, I picked up the autobiography, but it was still by happenstance. I just kind of said, you know, my mother was a teacher. So she said, these books were always around. And I, uh, I had sort of a you know, um, and so something in me was always maybe a little afraid of digging in deep into these autobiographies or biographies because I was afraid of what I would read about slavery, afraid that so something in me knew that what I was being taught was the sugar-coated version. So reading his autobiography, his narrative, and his words, it spun me out. And, and I thought I knew everything there was to know about him just from reading that autobiography. And I guess I'll hold for Nikhil to say what he knew before I uh, go on to what I found out later about him, which brought us here. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, very, very uh, happy to be here. Um, my experience is very similar. It was in high school and I'm, I, I think there, uh, you know, I learned about Frederick Douglass. I think it was a day. It was like uh, going through history 
Uh, and I'm not, I'm pretty sure he wasn't even on the test <laughs> or anything like that about that section. So uh, it was very, it was very minimal. Um, uh, but I'm glad that we have, you know, a, we're having Douglas week to promote his story and promote his message. So very thankful for that. So yeah, my, my first introduction of Douglas was in high school, but nothing uh, that was, you know, extensive. Don't anybody from America tweet us or add us about giving away the secret of our poor education system. Everybody knows. <laughs> Everybody knows. <laughs> And what about coming to Ireland? Um, obviously, you guys, do you want to tell, t tell uh, the viewers or whatever um, about what, what you're actually doing in Ireland? B besides Douglas Week, you're researching uh, some other projects. Do you want to give us a little bit of background to that, you, starting with you, Paul? Yeah, well, what happened was just I, I left off at the exact right point, I guess. Uh, I thought I knew everything there was to know. And uh, we were uh, in Hamilton and... Um, the show got shut down because of COVID and the next city was going to be Jacksonville, Florida. So I went ahead to Jacksonville because the word was do a 14 day quarantine. And I had already rented the place that I was going to go to in Jacksonville. And I thought, great, I'll sit there. This thing will be over. We'll be back to work in two weeks. Little did any of us know what would happen. But I, I came across this small black community theater company called Players by the Sea. And we chopped it up a little bit with our masks on, still exploring this new reality. We drove to St. Augustine, the oldest city in the US, um, where a lot of the slave markets originated, one of the first drop off uh, places where the ships would arrive in the States. And they asked me to do a new writer's workshop. And in the course of doing that, one of the other mentors told me, she, she lives in Wicklow, her name's Nadia Ramutar. And she was zooming in to the workshops and she, you know, wrote me on the side and said, hey, so I'm wondering, you, you know, I, I've been getting to know you in these workshops and I think you'd be interested in Frederick Douglass to write something. And I stopped her right there and said, oh, that's okay. I know everything about Frederick Douglass. There's nothing you, some woman from Ireland could tell me about Frederick Douglass. Ha ha ha, you know, <laughs> and she said, oh, so you know about how he came to Ireland and had to flee for his life and was aided and abetted by the Irish women who formed all the anti-slavery societies and uh, he became an international star speaking around the entire, and I was like, whoa, whoa, scratch that record. And um, I said, well, you, that can't be true because we would know about that. And she said, no, this is the place where he famously wrote that he, his whole life changed from his time in Ireland. And it was the first time he felt like he took a deep breath and he felt like a human being. And I was hooked. And there was no way I was not going to come. I could research. Uh, I was even connected to people who are historians. A lot of them are speaking this week in, in uh, Douglas Week. It wasn't enough. And being an actor who writes from an experience point of view, I wanted to get the experience. So, you know, found the date, reached out to Nikhil, who will tell his side of things and said, you know, let's, let's take this adventure together if you want to go. Or maybe you said to me, Nikhil, you wanted to go. I forgot how it sort of came up. We were playing tennis all summer and just hanging out. And I said I was going. Right? Was it something like that? I I just I just remember you asking me, or I, it happened organically. But I was like, yeah, I want to go. It was very very simple for me. That's what it, actors do. We want to we want to have the distance of when someone said, "Let's go to Ireland." I was like, yeah. yes. <laughs> Stevie, you're right. Like the, you know, Frederick was running from something, and we were running to something. But there was an escape from our country. Again, I don't want any tweets. I don't want any ads. I don't want. Any, we were running from something. Our country's in trouble. And even though we have a new administration, we're not out of the woods, right? We're not. We're not. We're not there yet. Even our new president will say, you know, he doesn't even want to be focused on what the Senate's doing. He's he's focused on what needs to get done. So there was something we were leaving behind. You know, I, I couldn't have predicted what would happen exactly on January 6th, but we both knew something was coming with this election coming up. So we both wanted out. Actually, and it's quite interesting. Sorry for interrupting you. Um, we have in this country certain um, problems and we've also had this complacency in a way, right? Uh, it, you can see it in America, like we thought, like finally Obama, we, we, we thought the changes were going to come, right? 
uh, so many years, civil rights. Um, but in this country, we've had this attitude of, oh, but at least we're not America. And we can see in this country now that, that there is, the, the, I keep saying mirrors, right? But there is deep, uh, and, and a lot of this isn't overt. It's systematic stuff, systematic problems. You guys know all about it anyway. But, but, but it's quite interesting that, that that's why I think Douglas Week uh, is, is very important in getting, because we all know that this isn't a, a legacy thing uh, about Frederick Douglas. We, we're all very thinking about like Douglas Week will hopefully be happening in another 100 years. And, and these curriculums will change the American education system, the Irish education system, because we all know true education. I think Frederick Douglass knew it more than anyone. But it is interesting uh, to, 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 to see that we have to, to deal with things here as well. What have you guys learned in Ireland particularly? Uh, has there been any major changes? Uh, like, as, obviously, when you travel, it is a spiritual thing anyway, uh, even if it's just a casual thing. I know you're going a bit deeper than that. But ha have you got, has it changed you guys in any way, any perspectives? The biggest thing it has done for me, and I want to get back to systemic and systematic change. I, I got something big to say about that. I want to get back to that. But the biggest thing Ireland has taught me is that being kind is easier than not being kind. Wow, I like that. Yeah, I think that, um, I know Paul can say differently, but I have not met one person who hasn't came up to me or I went up to them because I had a question or, or something happened where someone just wasn't kind. Um, so I, 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 I agree with that. It's a different, just walking around or being around here is a completely different feeling. Any interaction we, there are so many times where Paul and I, something would happen. We'd be like, you know, in New York city, that would not have, you know, it's every single time. Always <laughs> Remember when the snow came to kill not too long ago? You guys had a, uh, I don't know if it happened over the whole island, but there was a snow, maybe two inch, three inches, and we were up in Balbriggan. But at three o'clock in the morning, I'm trying to sleep, and I'm hearing noises of children in the street at two, three in the morning, because snow was something that they, and I look out the window, and there's dad with the daughter and the kid, and they're playing with the snow in the middle of the night. And I open my window, and I'm thinking, okay, don't don't be an American right now. There, don't don't yell. And the the girl looks up at me, and I thought she was gonna be afraid and tell the family to be quiet. She looked up at me and she went, "You coming out to play with us?" <laughs> I'm like, I'm in I'm in a new place. I I am somewhere else because in Chicago, New York, and and it does and just changing your surroundings like that, and and have have having our surroundings been changed for the past two two plus months it changes you i mean it's 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 i mean i i, I am forever changed in, in a way and i hope that when i go back to new york city i bring the, how i feel now back there i really really do it's gonna be really I remember the other day you said to I me know, it's gonna be really hard <laughs> you're on a walk and he goes man i wonder how long it's going to take me to turn back into my new york self when i get back <laughs> I wonder, I wonder how long it's going to be till I snap at someone. <laughs> but that just shows how important it is, yeah. uh, how much of an impact changing our surroundings, going to Ireland, all, all this stuff, how much of an impact it has had on us, um, on ourselves as humans, on ourselves as uh, artists, uh, as friends, as, as our outlook and perspective on life. It has really, really shaped it uh, a lot. And I hope you know, we, we actually market ourselves as this whole Cape me default to land of a thousand welcomes. And I actually do agree with you guys that we generally are nice people. Cause like if I'm at the tube or the subway in London or New York or wherever I say hi to someone, some guy looks at me back as if I'm, they're just going to kill me or something. So like we, we generally are a little bit friendlier, but that's why I would like if we could like certain influences that are happening at the moment in Ireland, um, which are contradictory to our history when it comes to uh, being a bit more welcoming. 
um, to migrants and stuff like that and systematic stuff. I know you're going to talk about that in a second, Paul. Um, like our direct provision system is pretty much systematic racism, whatever. And we've got a lot of stuff in the educational system. We don't have much visibility for people of minorities, whether they're whether they're their lawmakers, guardy, whether they're in the media or whatever. But I I would actually encourage anyone because we haven't got that much time to, to ask any questions, please, through the Q&A. But Paul, I know you wanted to speak a little bit more on that. Systems, you know, the word systematic comes from systems. And I really didn't expect, I didn't know what to expect from this uh, from this particular workshop, but you, you got some things swimming in my head. Systems are put in place and they've been put in place since before any of us can remember. And even when we are at our most well-meaning, sometimes the system, which is a patriarchal system, is the one that's been put in place makes us think that we have work to do to uh, reprogram ourselves or be inclusive. But what we really need to do is remember and return to what we originally were. I mean, it's interesting, like when you talked about black music, even though you named some great names, it was just interesting to me that Rosetta Tharp was not on the list. Big Mama Thornton was not on the list. Nina Simone, Bessie Smith, black women actually were the beginning of the, the rock music and uh, all of R&B and they're, they're at the beginning of it. And the LGBT artists, Frankie Knuckles, Little Richard, Michelle and Deggio Cello, an incredible bassist and poet. And, and, and when we mentioned the activists, you know, of course, Greta Thun, uh, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, Thunberg gets mentioned, but we leave off Mari Kopeni, Zia uh, Bastida, Isra Hirsi, Kevin Patel, Elsa Mengisti, all of the young activists of color don't, they just don't get mentioned. And that's the system. So even when it means well, we have to know that there, there is important work to do. And if there's a young people out there, look those people up and know that when you think you've gone back, you can even go further back. And so, and how that all relates for me now being here in Ireland is I knew nothing about the Irish women, Isabel Jennings from here in Cork and her mother, Ann Jennings, Rebecca Fisher and Susanna Fisher in Limerick, Mary McCracken in Belfast, Hannah Webb in Dublin, all these women that were forming the anti-slavery and abolitionist group. So for the young girls out here, yes, study Frederick Douglass, but know that Frederick went back to the States and was one of the few men that spoke at Seneca Falls for women's rights because he was so moved by what he saw here by the women. So there's, it's the system that makes us, even and when we're at our most well-meaning, we have to keep digging even deeper. Absolutely. I was delighted today that those young youngsters who are mainly girls, uh, teenagers, the CY artivists, um, that they were, they were sh shining a light on Frederick Douglass's wife today and that they were doing st certain stuff like that. Ella Fitzgerald actually uh, played in Cork way before my time. And my favorite artist would be uh, the likes of Dinah Washington, Nina Simone that you mentioned. And going back, I mean, you're mentioning people like Bess Bessie Smith and you're, you're, you're looking at like, that's why when I, when I did a piece that I think we, we might, we might be able to play at the end. Uh, Maya Angelou's voice is, is the first voice in it because you're right. It, it is uh, it's a patriarchal world. It's a white world. And it's about it's about changing it up. I I'd actually probably get in trouble for, for sorry, go on, Paul. And a heterosexual world. Absolutely, yeah. And that's why I wanted to reference in all that sort of constructed, you know, it's constructed. Yeah. No, particularly when you look at like musical history, that's why like disco is very dear to my heart. And and I mentioned that there was a racial element to the backlash, but lots of it was a homophobic element too. And this whitewashing, like people can accept it through house music, a very watered down version in some ways, uh, even though all the, the best house music and techno is coming from black inner cities as well. But, 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 but it was repackaged that uh, away from disco and, try to almost take it away. Lots of the, the vocalists in the disco era and even in modern dance music, lots of the female vocalists aren't credited on tracks. Their oh. names aren't on the tracks. The producers getting the credit sometimes. And these are actual singers like yourself, Paul. I'm going to get in trouble if I don't mention Sylvester is the perfect example. I'm going to get in trouble if I don't talk about Hamilton. So okay. how do you guys, um, is there a way, a vehicle like I mentioned some of the ways music can be powerful 
Um, but have you found in the vehicle and the whole, the whole, um, we'll say, um, yeah, the way Hamilton is delivered, the way you guys deliver it, the way previous people have done it, that it is a kind of a powerful way of making this this connection with the modern generation, particularly bearing in mind um, teenagers uh, and young people, and even the whole way it's subverted, like it, it wouldn't normally have been a, a, a black cast doing white stuff, you know, it, it all goes back to what we're saying. Uh, no one would ever have a problem um, if it was the other way around through history. It, it's always looked at would say from a, from a white perspective and a male perspective and a heterosexual perspective of privilege or whatever, but has that given it extra power for you guys? Or have you any perspectives of that? The way, like, you know, there's rapping in it or it's modern or there's different ways of getting your message across. I think that, you know, Hamilton has made it feel like it is uh, accessible to be a part of, you know, part of the Broadway community. I know so many people who would never, ever listen to a Broadway show, but because there's hip hop and there's rap, people are like, oh, wait, let me understand what this is. Because in their everyday music, that's what they listen to, and now it's something different. So I think that it has become more accessible to people. But also, I think that it's it's wonderful how Hamilton, you will see uh, from 12 to 80, you know, it's not just a certain demographic of these people like Hamilton or these people like, you know, my fairly, you know, it's not that it's like, it is the scope and the range is so wide. And I have to say that is the, inf the infusion of everything, or should I say the fusion of everything, but also it is, it is the music. And I also think it's the message and they kind of interlocked at a, a really pure and solid place that it's, it allows so many people from so many different walks of life. One, because, I mean, Paul, if you want to just tell, like, how simple and classic the story is and how classic the storytelling of it is, but it is so classic and it's so accessible that I think that that's why it has allowed for it to be, you know, for so many people to enjoy it. Yeah, I mean, I actually don't need to. You pretty much said it. I mean, I'll, I'll just tack on what, what he's referring to is that I often say that the, the tricky and cool thing that Lynn did was he told a very simply structured Western story so that for those who are afraid to come in with hip hop and rap as though it's going to go so fast, all these words, they sit down and there's the villain, the hero, the father figure, George Washington, the love story, the three buddies that travel with him. It's like Star Wars or Wizard of Oz or Dorothy. Mm -hmm. It's like a, a, you're one of, a great Western, you know? So it's something that the framework of it, you sit there and your psyche gets it because we've heard these stories as children growing up. I just want to say on a personal level, so that's the broader framework of it. But on a personal level, since we're on this topic as a black gay man playing the leader of a huge army who was the first president of the US. And you know, there's no way to play George Washington. That's a silly thought. You don't play him, you, you bring yourself to it. I appreciate that the producers and the casting people and the director and Lynn are, are open to exactly that. You know, no one ever told me you have to act like George Washington. You know, you have to do that. They just let me bring myself to it. So that's mm -hmm. another smart thing he's doing. And Nikhil, why don't you talk about that day you were rehearsing to go on as the king yeah i'm not yeah. sure if it was you stepped to me or i stepped to you i was talking about john Devereux. But... yeah we were just having a conversation and i think i was uh in rehearsals for for the king um and you know um paul came up to me and says i said this to another cast member uh uh who plays the king and he's black and, he, and it's just like how, how does one do that you know and then he says think about your ancestors Think about all of the Indian Maharajas and Maharani's, all of them, that have, you have it in your blood. Who, who, you, you, your ancestors were kings and queens before King George the Third ever even was a thought in someone's, you know. So, you know, but I, I, I have been made to think that. Oh, when I think king, I don't think Indian. Well, that's the systems that I'm hey, talking about. The I think royalty. Him would never think king. It's like, what are you talking about? I never connected it until I had that conversation with Paul. You know, um, but but yeah, uh, I. 
That's I powerful, love- man. I mean, it's like, it's, like, it's like women being president. We still in America talk about, oh my God, that day, what a day it will be when finally we have, a-. in the Yoruba tradition, they didn't even have a difference between male and female. It was yeah. a colonization that said, these are females and these are males and we're gonna make them lower and we're gonna trick it in your mind. But, and they took all the deities and made them all male and stripped women from the power in the history. So it's not a matter of getting something new. It's a matter of remembering that women were always politically on an equal level. They were all, and I mean, I'm tired of using that word. It's a constructed word. You know, we're all human. And, you know, who's got, whoever's got the best ideas and can get the people behind them, that's the person who will lead the, the group, right? You said it, guys. What would you say to being conscious again of some of the, the viewers or whatever would be teenagers, maybe trying to make their way in entertainment, music or whatever? Would you give any advice? Like, I know I have certain advice that I always say to certain people um, is basically enjoy it. Try to find your own lane and stick to your guns and stuff like that. But re- really do enjoy enjoy yourself first. Would you give any if there's a teenager, if there's someone 16 and in, in wherever they are in Ireland at the moment or around the world watching this, would you give any advice to someone? Um, I mean, it could be from singing or acting or anything, really. Uh, any any little thing that you could think of? Um. I'm going to kind of go, I mean, kind of base this around Douglas and music and everything like that. And that the, you know, something about like um, even genres is that like, we think that some, for some reason, at least I think that, Oh, all the genres have been created. Jazz, blues, blah, blah, blah. Are they, uh, 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 uh. Right. no, in a couple of years, there will be a new genre just as dubstep dubstep is actually from, hip hop all from black people if it's from trap music all these things are new genres that are coming there's going to be something new in the future um and i think that just knowing that like that's about fusion of things and i think that to uh and with fusion of things there's you can't do that with bringing your own individuality without bringing yourself to something because you and and your surrounding me trying to bring Indian classical music or pop or whatever to Irish music, which is something that we are doing w- with uh, with the people that we've met here. Um, I think that there's a, I mean, it's a very, very general splash message, but a lot of things of um, embracing your individuality and, and, and knowing that that is one of the strongest things that we have um, to always bring to any table and to know that with that, um, you have the potential to create something incredibly um, new or accessible just as a new genre. You know, who, who, I, I bet there's if there's someone listening right now, you might be one of the people that's about to create a new genre of music or anything like that. So uh, That's really powerful when yeah. you think of it that way. I mean, everything has been kind of... Everything is mirrored, as I keep saying, but there's always new, new, new perspectives, new ways... And this is true of the centuries. You mentioned kings. I mean, we're going back to like Egyptian times and and queens, kings, uh, people uh, like you go back to uh, Nikhil, your ancestors, uh, like the first people in America. Uh, you go back to the traditions and we, we talk about music in that way. We talk about. So it's quite powerful that we always have a, a different perspective, even though there's different ways of. of, of but that's a really cool thing for, for young people to, to have that feeling of of you can you can kind of create this genre or whatever. Uh, it'll be interesting. Just make sure you tell me as a DJ, because I want to be first on it if there's a new genre. Yeah, exactly. Stevie, <laughs> they should, um, and if you, you know, if you can't take a, sh- a ship across the ocean like Frederick, or if you can't get on a plane like we did, you still must expand your world, whatever your world is. If that means go talk to that kid that you didn't talk to yesterday, if that means you know, ask your parents, can we take a drive and go to see this thing over here that I haven't seen? Expand your world so that you can find the commonality because the first first rhythm is the drum and the drum comes from what? The heartbeat. And we all spent what? Nine months somewhere before we came out and our heartbeat came. So we all have that as the first music we've ever heard. What's the second music we ever heard? Spoken word. 
from our mother, even while we're still in their belly or when we first come out. So you kids, listen, you're, you're doing the thing. Anybody who tells you like, oh, that's not music, hip hop, beats and DJ, that's not music. That's the original music, right? So you, you have to expand your world in order to find the common thing that makes us all the same. Yeah. Right? And it's interesting too that the limitations, um, even on the ships, you couldn't, like even when the instruments were taken, you've got your beatbox, you've got your voice, even when your voice is taken. They tried and even, it. Sorry, go on. I'm just going with you. They tried it. To take oh it. yeah. And even they, like the origins of hip hop as well, uh, which I didn't speak about, a lot of... Um, like there's an economic thing that you it's it's hard to afford two guitars, a bass and a full drum kit or whatever. But back in the parks, in the Bronx and stuff, you got and you got your voice. And and even when even when it came to like the and the technology these days, you can do so much on your phone. And if you don't have a phone, you can do it anyway. Uh, if the birds can sing, we can. So that that's just it's, it's a really powerful thing for people to because I've noticed even sometimes when I've got more equipment and stuff that the better stuff I've done was when I had less gear and out of necessity. Um, yeah. It's quite interesting. Let me shout it out to Ireland though too, because you know, step dancing is very popular in uh, black colleges, but the stepping and the rhythm and the soul of Irish music, there's something deep. And when I found out about Newgrange, I was like, wait, y'all been here on this forested <laughs> island for way before some of these other things that we think can you know ireland was here with the rhythm and the you know the cross temporal worlds and the these mystical stories that that's real and so the rhythm and the feet in ireland and trad music that that's a real thing uh as far as let's go back you know i, I would say research in your own country and you'll find a lot of incredible incredible things regarding rhythm and spoken word Actually, it's one of the things I always try to teach. Um, we're going to wrap up in a second, but I, I always try to tell our youngsters that like, we come from a massive, um, especially with hip hop, America is so powerful in influence. And in the UK, for example, they use, it's like gr gr grandchildren of the people who came from the Caribbean many years ago. Some of them came from Ireland. They're actually using their own background. In, in, in England, it's coming from, a lot of it is coming from the Caribbean. Um, but you use your own background. And in Ireland, like that's one way that like, Kendrick isn't going to have the Irish spoken thing or Beyonce isn't going to have this. So you use your angle. And that's what a lot of the interesting people in Ireland, the youngsters who are creating new music here is you, you use something no one else has. That's what Nikhil's talking about. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, it's, it, it's amazing because no one is Nikhil, no one is Paul or no one is, is, is whoever, whoever else is, is watching. Um, Guys, it's been absolutely brilliant. I know I'm back with you guys in a while, but like I had planned to play some music and stuff. We had planned to get some questions, Fiona. I haven't even given you a look in, but I, I, I'm sh I'm sorry for hogging the mic. I could talk to these guys forever. Um, is there any questions in the chat or is there anything else do you want to add? I'm going to maybe leave Fiona and Tim and the gang do the wrap ups. But I just want to sign out by saying, Paul and Nikhil, I really appreciate you taking the time out. And I'm so happy that you're in Ireland um, and you're going to be coming back again and again and again. And uh, there's relationships here that will be going for Douglas Weeks um, for, for many years and, um, and uh, onwards and upwards. And, and I'll see you later as well. Yeah. Of course. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Did you want to talk about Barrett's Town? I watched that video and it was awesome. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, no, um, it was lovely to be part of this. Thank you so much for, for sharing your, your time and talent, like I said earlier today, um, and your insights. I loved that parallel um, between Frederick Douglass's journey, you know, of, of expanding your world and you'll see the things that connect us. Like it's, it's macro, it's micro to macro, like it's, and, and that journey to, to Ireland really was, uh, was an eye opener. And I think anyone who travels and your journey here is almost, you know, there's a parallel with pilgrimages, there's loads of stuff. Anyway, none of that's to do with Bardstown, but um, no, we're delighted to be, to be um, part of this. And I'm really grateful to, to Douglas Week for, for connecting a lot of dots here, because obviously, Therapeutic activity is a lot of what we do in Barthstown as well with, with connecting children, so. Well, that's what music is, right? Music is therapy, right? 
you know, no. it, yeah. it actually heals. It, you can have Western medicine, you can try different things. I love and appreciate doctors and vaccines and, you know, yes, vaccines and all of that. But music, I'm sure you've seen children completely change. It's so empowering as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's wonderful. It's magic, really. It's magic. The real yeah. medicine. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it allows children to generate their own magic then as well. It just has a ripple effect then. Right. It's wonderful. Now that I could go on with for hours. I know, I'm, I'm, I'm stunting I, myself. I, I think, our, I think time. our time is up. So <laughs> yeah. Tim, Tim is looking at his watch. He's the referee at the moment. So I, I, think, uh, I think our time is up and I'm conscious of the fact that we've got a whole night of this ahead of us. So yeah. Tim or Sarah or anyone else, you guys want to wrap up? Fiona, thanks a million. It's been no, great to you. be a part of it. Uh, big thanks to our guests, Paul and Nikhil. And uh, we, we look forward to seeing all the projects that you guys are going to create in the future. And uh, we look forward to seeing how your uh, Ireland, your perspective of Ireland has influenced things too. Uh, so that's it for, for me anyway. Um, and uh, we leave you guys wrap up. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, I just want to say thanks, everyone. This one's fantastic. I've just been sitting back, soaking up the chat. It's been uh, it's been so interesting. And this um, this this kind of workshop, as well as the whole week, but even just this chat is a tribute to what, what connections can make and what happens when you put different people in the same place and, and, and just let them let them talk. So um, yeah, it's been amazing. Thanks very much. Thanks to everyone for joining today. A quick reminder that there are more events on. Um, as Stevie and the guys have said, they are willing off to do more events now, which you can still sign up for for free on douglasandcork.com. We have a musical extravaganza this evening uh, with all these people involved. Um, it's going to be great. So please go onto the website, uh, sign up for free uh, for anything you would like, and, and there's more stuff happening all week. Thanks again and um, goodbye from us. Thank you.